before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people, and I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude to Elders past, present and emerging. And I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands in which everybody is meeting on from working from today. Um, I'm extremely excited to hear Rebecca's lecture today. Rebecca was part of Experimental Life Forms. Uh, that exhibition um, is the third time that Experimenta has um, exhibited at the lockup. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the lockup spaces, we are um, a contemporary art space that operates from a historical building. Um, it's an 18th century police station and lockup. And the experimenter exhibition always just looks powerful and engaging um, when presented in such a space. The Experimental Life Forms exhibition included the work of 26 uh, international and Australian artists. And Rebecca is one of those artists with her work, Snow Rabbits, which um, was a definite favorite in the exhibition. Um, her work was presented in one of our male cells um, with graffiti on the wall, a really colonial kind of context. And I think that her work really shone in, in that um, space, definitely. So Rebecca is a Canberra-based artist and her works are interactive sculptural installations. Um, she often uses animatrix animatronics and sound in her work and her practice is um, often investigating perceptions um, within cultures that have conflicting histories. So yes, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rebecca and hear her lecture today. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm in Canberra on Ngunnawal Ngambri land and I would like to extend my huge gratitude and respect to elders past, present and future. Um, so this is my first Zoom um, artist talk and I'm a little bit nervous because usually you can gauge everyone by their, you know, faces, reactions, but I don't have any of that. So I'm just talking to my computer um, and just assuming that everybody's there. So I have put together a, um, oh, I should point out that this beautiful picture behind me, um, this is by my gal, my best friend, Kat Mueller, and it is my favorite painting, um, just because it will be the backdrop for me for this talk. Um, so yeah, I've got, I put together a presentation and I'm just gonna talk about my work, like where it, um, where it originated from, um, like how I'm positioned in that in each of my pieces, um, my own evolution as an artist, as a person. Um, and I'll be talking especially about the making of the Snow Rabbits piece, which was originally made in 2018, um, almost a kind of temporal piece because it had a branch in it that died over time. But obviously that's not, um, you know, that wouldn't really work for a three year tour. So in 2020, 2021, I went through a massive process of reholing it, um, upgrading all the motors, um, making that living branch into a essentially a, a plastic one. So with hot heaps of different um, methods of casting and model building. Um, so I'll put on my Hang on, I'll just make sure I've got everything looking good and then I'll put on my screen share. Cool. Where am I? Share screen. Okay, share screen. And PowerPoint. Brilliant. Okay, this is me, um, Rebecca Selleck. And this is me back in 2013. Um, so 
I was in second year uni then. Um, and this, these were kind of the first of my little interactive animatronic pieces. Um, this one is called, uh, at the top, it's called Invasive Bird. So I made it out of, I don't have any close up photos. I'm so terrible at documentation, but um, it was like a little silicon piece with, um, with bird fed, like a pillow feathers are dyed to resemble a kind of Indian minor form. And there was a sound, uh, a movement activated little speaker in there that would do a bird call whenever you walked past it. So like it was a little play on words that it's an invasive bird um, in Australia, the Indian minor, but then also it was quite invasive because it would go off every time you walked past. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, on a, on a wattle branch. Um, and then there's a little rabbit as well. Um, and that one was, um, it had a little heater inside it, um, which, yeah, so you touch it and it was like a bit warm. Um, it had the fur, so you could see I started making these like interactive installation spaces um, already back then. That was my interest. And I already started using, um, you know, like the, I guess like the skins of animals, feathers, pelts as a way to um, draw people in and, and create a sense of empathy. And that sense of empathy has always been really important to me in my practice. So um, the way that, so yeah, at that point I was really interested in how we connect with inanimate objects. Um, and so you can see that even more in these sort of things, these were, you know, like third year, just um, experimentations in uh, how to make forms that were obviously objects, but we could connect with in some way, form an empathetic bond with, um, not really a bond, but you know, a um, bit of a one-way thing there. But I, it was something that really intrigued me since a young age, um, because I just always felt, um, so much for everything around me um you know like I remember being a little kid and going to pick out an ice cream from the shop and feeling sad for the other ice creams that were left behind and it's like it's not really anything real so um I sort of started thinking about like all the different ways that other creatures and organisms interact um and I made these kind of forms I don't think that so this is, um, this is all made from feathers and silicon and it glows at night. So I was thinking about bioluminescence and um, texture and pattern. Um, but then I, I kind of got to the point in my honours where I was really thinking about how we personally as humans connect with others and that it was a lot more than just an idea of what's um, inanimate. It's, there's like... Um, you know, deep dialogues that we have with all creatures around us that create a lot of, um, you know, dichotomies, a lot of hypocrisies, um, and we we feel those every day. So I started trying to live those out in my practice through honours, um, creating these installation, like small installation spaces, almost tableaus, um, you know, referencing that traditional idea of taxidermy and um turning it on its head um so we've got this one fencata watering hole i'm just drinking my coffee um and yeah so i was really thinking about like well rabbits became as you can tell by the work at the lockup um they became a big theme throughout my work um because they do just have such a diversity of ways that uh, we think about them and interact with them. Um, so rabbits are obviously, you know, our pets. They're really sweet and cute little mammals. So we can identify with, with them um, and we feel for them. We make friends with them. Um, they also are um, a pest in Australia. Um, they are for hunting, they are a food source, they are a fashion item, they are tested on in labs, 
Um, and so there's many ways like the rabbit in itself just globally can be considered an animal that we connect with and at the same time disconnect with. Um, so we connect with them on a really caring level as small, cute little creatures, uh, but then can totally disconnect um, when we, you know, think of them as a food source, a fashion source, something for testing. And, and rabbits themselves have, you know, become that, um, that figurehead for, um, you know, like for, I guess for Peter is one example um, that we need to treat animals better. Um, but in Australia, there's certainly like an even more complex history. Uh, so they were introduced um, during colonization by Europeans uh, for hunting. Um, and I won't go too, too deep into it. There's um, an amazing book on the history of rabbits in Australia. Um, but yeah, so they were introduced here. Essentially today they've gone feral. We've tried to um, just like, you know, we've tried to get bring down their populations with so many different things. Um, eventually, you know, like biological warfare. Um, this artwork itself talks about my history with my European background as a Maltese person. So um, immigrant, um, so yeah, like, uh, second generation immigrant um, and also my English background, my English um, Irish background. Um, and yeah, so I have these memories of growing up around a, um, like around a dining table. Like I'd go to my auntie's house, it'd be like this dark wood dining table. There'd be like this oriental style rug and there would be a big pot at the center and it would be filled with fencada which is rabbit stew and um yeah so this is kind of a a, a homage to that fencada is the national meal of malta by the way um and oh yeah when when um the British came into Malta to colonize there. They also forbade the Maltese people from hunting rabbits um, because they wanted them for themselves. Um, but hey, like Vincata is a national meal. So anyway, um, so much, so much history. Uh, and yeah, and then also thinking about this really iconic image. Oh, I should have put it up, but there's this really iconic image of um, of myxomatosis being released on an island um, and there's rabbits around a watering hole, just thousands or just like so many rabbits around this watering hole because they were incredibly, incredibly thirsty because they were being dried out from the inside from this virus. Um, so I, I, this is like these works I made in honours, I think were really, um, you know, groundbreaking for me because they did something that I keep repeating throughout my practice because it works for me, like how my head works. Um, this idea of overlaying time and history and creating these um, these installations that tie things together. They're sort of surreal in some ways, but I don't like saying that they draw too much on surrealist traditions. They're just, um, yeah, they're just a way of condensing information, making these um, non-linear stories. Um, yeah, so I've got, I've got this one. Oh, and by the way, yeah, so this one, uh, the rabbits in here are warm. They have um, heated elements through them. So you can go and interact with this piece. Um, you can touch the rabbits, which have this semblance of life. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, taxidermic representations where you try to make things as lifelike as possible. I tried to demonstrate in these works that kind of uh, how the, you know, these animals are somewhere on the spectrum between um, like alive and having autonomy and also being objects to us um, that are for our personal use uh, as humans. Um, so, you know, I, I've gotten these old skins and turn them back into animals but they they don't really have communicatory capacity like they don't 
they don't have the ability to move around. They don't have eyes. They're just enough so that you you kind of get what they are. Um, unless you're some people who think they're tiny wombats, but um, that's okay. I like wombats too. Um, so I started, I, yeah, I made this one in my honesty, which I really love. So you could lay with this cow that was made from an Ikea, like a, a rug that was, you know, a cow from Brazil who was killed, turned into a rug, um, like sold through Ikea. Someone had it on their floor. Then I bought it and then I turned it back into a cow. And um, so I was, these were um, me get, my, doing my first um, semblance of breathing. So I was really trying to engage people through, um, well, what I, what I found in my own is you was like three specific ways, like um, devices I could use to draw people in um, and try and make them like try and draw them into my my world and these like intense feelings um, around our interactions with with other species and the environment. Um, so furniture, like furniture contours, like it's made for our bodies. It contours to our bodies. We um, we see them and we even sit in them and we're immediately connected. Um, and then there's, you know, the, the skins which remind us of other mammals or other species that we might feel a connection with. We want to pat them, we want to touch them, we want to nurture them potentially, um, or we might be freaked out by them. Um, and then there's the semblance of life. So the, the, uh, the body warmth, the breathing, um, and... Yeah, I think there's also like the fourth one, which is, I don't know, kind of that, I like that nostalgia. Um, so, you know, like I'm talking here about this, um, this childhood memory, like a lot of these are childhood memories. This is like, you know, the bed I had when I was younger, except I never had a double bed. I wasn't that lucky. Um, and you know, then there, there was this one I also made, um, which is called Lovers Scoundrels. These chairs would rock back and forth. Um, and um, I wanted to create like a kind of iconic Australian um, space. So, you know, the, the front of the deck, like the front of the house on the deck, the rocking chairs, the gum leaf print. Um, and then we have these hunted fox pelts that um, kind of, you know, are in some ways quite romantic. Um, I had this, there was this show, Farthing Wood Friends, that I really loved when I was a kid. And the, it was the British show and it was about these animals uh, trying to find their home or find a new home. And the two lead like the hero and the heroine were two foxes and they were so smart and brave and amazing. And um, yeah, it's just, you know, the, that perception growing up with that perception as a child and then um, you know, how it shifts when you get older and, you know, you have to hold this dual idea of the fox as a beautiful, intelligent creature, but also one that in this country, you know, being introduced for sport, um, and then also like, you know, bringing down entire populations of native species with it. Um, it, yeah, it's also a villain. Um, so I like creating these sort of dualities because yeah, so all these pieces are kind of uncomfortable because when something's uncomfortable, you kind of, you don't immediately arrive at, um, you don't immediately arrive at an idea when something's uncomfortable you want to try and find answers and I guess in these ways like these works are their their own kind of questioning entities um so then further on like I I was like why don't I make giant rabbits so these ones um you know this this one's like mm, how tall was it it's like 
almost a meter and a half tall and there's these little rabbits and they're warm and they're breathing they're made from old rabbit skin coats and people can go sit with them and cuddle up to them um and yeah just again thinking about that dichotomy between um how we connect with animals and disconnect and also you know that I think there's a specific relevance to using rabbits in Australia um from what I talked about earlier with those convoluted histories and um then there was this one lapin plague so um I call I call these ones lapin which is like what was written on a on a lot of the the coats that these rabbit furs came from so I just was going on eBay and all over and buying secondhand coats and some of them were like 60 years old and they would have French writing on them and uh, it's pretty interesting like with the rabbit outbreak um, in Australia you know it fueled a whole hunting industry for people so there was you know people who were who were really against rabbits but then there were people who were making a lot of money out of rabbit meat and fur and for you know a lot of people during droughts and um, the rabbit plagues themselves it was a means of feeding your family and staying alive um, and it's possible like a lot of these coats could have come from there a lot of them probably came from um, you know rabbit farming as well which is horrible um, so yeah I, I, I made this piece from lots of little rabbits so these ones um, you walk into the space it's like an old kind of I don't know, English ballroom or um, then there's all these rabbits that are converging on these two chairs. They've got heated wiring all through them. So they're warm to the touch. Um, all of these little ones I make with um, wire and um, like chicken, chicken wire netting. So when you feel them, like they feel like they have spines and they feel like they have hip bones and um, it's a bit eerie um and at the center you know I was really wanting to think about how it's in fact um our human interactions and communications and these like I don't know um it, it that's what runs the world that's what controls like all these species fates all of our like the fate of our you know different environments and ecosystems um, I, I just, yeah, just, just the idea of how our worlds are constructed um, and us being at the centre and um, human dialogue and communication being so important. Um, so then we have this one. This is the original snow rabbits. Um, so we, we have what I talked about, which is the, um, the living branch so nice and green and beautiful. Um, I also had living little plants coming through. So they were baby snow gums. Um, and yeah, and the little, um, the little breathing rabbits who were made very similarly to the heated rabbit forms and it did not work that well uh, longevity wise for the motors being surrounded by little tiny bits of wire if you so you know having been someone who made work all the time people could touch if people did touch these they would squish and bits of wire would get stuck in the rotating motor arms um and i'll i'll show you in a bit um what i'm talking about with how these breathe um so this work i was really thinking about um yeah i was thinking about rabbits again and, and i hadn't really thought about them for a while but I read this article and it was talking about how, um, you know, there was this natural limit of where rabbits could get to um, in Australia. So this, um, you know, of uh, how high they could get. And now they, like, and then they had started going even higher because they'd kind of adapted to eat the, the leaf, like the eucalypt leaves of the new shoots and the new saplings. Um, and that was meaning that they were able to rise even higher um, in the um, Kosciuszko area. Um, and I thought that was super interesting. Um, yeah, kind of how 
uh, these um, invasive species, like, yeah, they, they have their own way of adapting um, just like everything else does around us. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's something I think about a lot as well. Like whenever I, I, I mean, my house, I think about what was here before my house. And when I go out to the, you know, like to the bush, cause I'm in Canberra, I'm so like, we're so lucky here. Um, we can go 10 minutes in any direction and we're at some beautiful state park, um, or territory park and but I, I you know I, I also think about how virtually no space in Australia is untouched now from um, invasive plant species invasive um, animal species and how and even you know like um, uh, how environmental change so land clearing how that's affected the weather systems like the local weather systems and how that's changed what species live there. And I mean, but you can't really go into any of your like natural parks and think this is how it was a couple hundred years ago. Cause it's not like, they're not healthy. Um, it's beautiful to see uh, endemic plants around when you like, when, when you see them, you're like, yeah, that's really nice. But, you know, you have to think about how much stuff has shifted as well. Um, and the impact of urban environments, how, and, and our, our lives, how that spreads throughout the entire continent. Um, so this, this is like, um, yeah, along the same vein. So um, I, I was like, I, thinking about how we disrupt environments, but also about that sense of national identity and how kind of deeply disturbed that is, that sense of national identity, when we think about it as like cattle rovers and, you know, sheep wranglers, I don't know. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, Australia, as a lot of people think of it today, you know, people say like, oh, it was built off the sheep's back, like our economy and all that, like was um, was essentially built off destroying a lot of the landscape, um, you know, displacing and destroying cultures of our first peoples. Um, it's, it's a horrific thing. And so we have this cow, which is like meant to be iconically Australian in a lot of ways. Um, but it's an introduced species that is completely ill-suited to this environment um, and has done so much damage but still continues to exist in this place. Like there's a, a, a wetlands area not far from us where the government has cows grazing to keep the grass down and it just seems idiotic to me. Um, so yeah, I, I made this work called Cow in the Waddle and it's um, a warm breathing cow form. Um, and again, I want people to empathize with these animals as well as recognize that they kind of aren't meant to be here and the, the ludicrousy in, in, in this whole situation um, and kind of how it, it's, it's us that, that started this, that did this, and, and we kind of need to make some big changes. But um, yeah, so I want people to connect with these animals. Um, it's not their fault, but it's it's also heart-wrenching to think like everything we've done, especially like, so these are commercial like um, creatures like sheep and cows, they're kind of brought here and then bred for, for um, meat milk skins like they probably are have all right lives compared to some other countries or other places with less humane practices um but then you know there's species like rabbits and foxes and others that are killed for sport and poisoned and so it's a really hard one it is it's like i think the uh, ethics around animals in australia specifically introduced species is 
So heart wrenching. Um, yeah. So, uh, oh, this is like seems very off topic, but I went away to a, um, I went away to a residency in Fremantle, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go back and do some casting, um, and. I hadn't done resin casting before, but I'd done bronze casting and different like concrete casting, all this sort of stuff when I was at ANU um, School of Art. Uh, I was at the sculpture workshop there and I really enjoyed it. So I started, I, I made these forms, which were like, I, I went around and was collecting pieces of rubbish and um, like single use plastic rubbish and then, you know, making them solid plastic forms embedded with endemic fauna and like not endemic flora Jesus and then um yeah so cigarette packs and chip packets and coffee cups water bottles pill packets uh it's really funny when you're looking for specific materials that you need that are like found objects because um they when you spot them they start feeling like treasure so I found myself um incredibly excited to be finding a piece of rubbish around um the cigarette butts were the most disgusting to make molds of that was gross um so yeah I I quite enjoyed this process and it sort of led me to do more casting um you know I'm really I've been doing lots of casting lately I'm really enjoying it um and we can see, so this is the first iteration of a giant installation I did um, called Invasive. So it's like my most um, like epic installation to date. So um, I, I, um, so I, I went through, I may, I was working with Parks uh, ACT and um, wildlife ACT and casting, um, making molds of dead animals, so essentially dead death casts. Um, I also had some of the warm rabbits. Um, so, and then I had like all of these, um, I collected all of these historical images from pre colonial and so, you know, Dutch images and, um, you know British ones from different magazines and was looking at different species that might not be as successful now or um yeah so just looking at the way that we is there more here yeah um kind of um you know have capitalized um or objectified the natural environment um so I have I decided you know, I would have all of these, you know, we've got the foxes again, we've got the um, cat, like rocking fox, the breathing cow, the rabbits through here. Um, so all the introduced species. Um, and then I've got the, um, I should put more photos, but I've got the native species almost becoming like what's holding up this installation. So, you know, there's the cast kangaroo feet. Um, this was a kangaroo joey that um who lost his mum and then he died as well um oh and i do have a video so i've got a video from the second iteration um where is it here um and
Okay, okay, wait, wait, wait. And then, okay. Okay, I just looked at the my phone and I realized I've done that thing where I talk too much. Um, so, okay, look, gone into casting again here. And um, we can, so this work was for um, my Art of the Threatened Species residency where um, it was like a year and a half, just like over, like, you know, we would connect up with a specific, um, you know, just specific scientists through the Office of Environment and Heritage um, and learn about a specific animal. I chose the Eastern Bristle bird. Um, so this little brown bird, um, it just, it doesn't fly, it just sort of darts around super shy, um, like just has talks like once a year when it's, or once or twice a year when it's time to mate, to try and find a, a mate. Um, but yeah, their populations are hugely decimated. Um, and I really connected with it. Um, so one of it, so its biggest threat is actually land clearing. Um, also introduced species like foxes, feral cats. Um, and I'd spent so long making these animatronic introduced species but I wanted to make something a lot um, softer. Um, I made, so I made this work. Um, these are all cast elements. I got this colonial kind of, um, well, it's a French style um, two seater. And um, I, you know, like sanded it back, redid it, did the green upholstery. And I, um, I had a hunter, I co contacted a hunter through Gumtree um, who said he, you know, hobby guy shoots foxes. And I said, when you next shoot a fox, can I have it to cast? And he said, yeah, that's fine. So this is a death cast of a dead fox. Um, it, all of these death casts are like horrendous to do. They, you know, they make me cry. And the same as making those, um, you know, those animal forms from, um, from found furs because you you're stitching into them and you can really I don't know it almost feels like you're stitching into your own body um but yeah so I really wanted to talk about you know just yeah that pa that painful complexity so death on both sides but there's so much weight to a species going extinct um to losing an entire species and and this is what's happening in Australia all the time um and it breaks my heart like <laughs> um kind of just feels like economic gain is always precedent um but yeah just look at the little brown bird poor little brown bird <laughs> and then um I finished this I finished this piece sort of the day before my son was due or was it the day? No, it was the day before my son was due, but then he was really kind and was four days late. So I had like a bit of a holiday, which was great. Um, and then not long after we had those massive, massive fires um, and they, they destroyed a lot of bristlebird habitat. So where I'd gone and collected all of these leaves and everything, um, yeah, that was all gone. So this was, this took me so many months because I had a newborn and he was quite sick. So I just had no time, but I wanted to make, so like I wanted to do something. Those fires really affected me. Like they did a lot of people. Um, I sort of made this as a homage, the fire and the bristle birds. So these are all cast elements in bronze and then um, yeah, patina black then custom made bench and um a little velvet pillow um okay geez what's the time sorry if anyone wanted questions geez um i will try and speed it up so this is the work remade i um 
I souped up those rabbits. I actually have some video, but as we discovered in our trial one, it's very glitchy. I can show you how ugly they look inside. Um, so this is what they look like. This is the tiniest little rabbit. Sorry for the glitchiness, but it's just a little cam system that I make and then it pushes and pulls. You can kind of make it out. Uh, and then it has some fabric over the top with some padding. I've got a little silicon thing there so it doesn't push through the fur when I eventually put that back on. And there we have it, a tiny breathing rabbit. Um, so there, the wiring goes under here. It's all hooked up. And then I made this. This is actually mild steel with different layers of um of like fiberglass and um then sanded back and layers and layers of paint to try and mimic the the um sort of snow gum patina um and then this is me making the leaves so i got snow gum leaves and um i like because I had to make them flexible so they wouldn't break and I wanted the everything right I I spent so many months trying to get these leaves right it's one of those things where you're like yeah it'd be so easy I will just remake the branch and it was such a huge learning curve um so I eventually found this semi-rigid stuff that I used and I um, mixed up all of these different um pigments to try and get that perfect color um, and that's what they're like coming out. So you can get all of the detail. Um, and then I just trim off all the, the gross bits. Um, and there you go. And I used copper wire to make the, the smaller branches. Um, I had different ideas of how I was going to do it, but this is what ended up looking the most realistic in the end, surprisingly. Um, oh, and there's that little rabbit. So that's the one that you saw earlier. Um, and I've started collaborating with my partner a lot, who is James Tyler. Um, if you haven't heard of him, then you should look him up. He's a really, um, really amazing artist. Um, so we made this, like, so we're both really interested in Australian environment, Australian history um, and, and culture. And so we made this, it, um, it's called Inhabiting, uh, body of work that... Um, uses Australian indigenous timbers, cast elements. Um, and we were, and you know, there's a little high chair there and everything, just kind of looking at what it is to be a family in Australia with our like mixed, um, you know, colonial immigrant indigenous heritages and, um, uh, you know, with like that connection to the landscape. And then, you know, we had this really sick sun going through bushfires, coronavirus. Um, so it was, yeah, important work to us, you know, um, and then the animals, you know, encroaching the space um, were kind of this physical and psychological tension around everything that was going on. Um, and then this is one of my most recent works and probably my most favourite to date. I'll just like so we just like Asana just had his um his heart surgery and we were driving you know back from um Sydney um oh, we we're driving back from Coomera at that point actually and then um through National Park and we hit well we didn't hit anything actually we we saw someone in front of us hit um kangaroo left it the joey was to the side of the road and um we're trying to get her him to a carer and he died in my arms and we had like you know all through it all like our son was just in the back seat sleeping I just couldn't help think about um how Lana I couldn't stop thinking about how my son has everything possibly done for him and then there's this other mother who is left dead on the road and her son's left dead on the side of the road Lana stop it and um yeah I made this work for them um and yeah so they were left under a eucalypt tree 
Um, I just, yeah, I want to be able to sit with him and, yeah, feel something, you know. Uh, so there's some of the bronze cast branches. I did that with a MIG welder and it was so hard. I have a TIG welder now, um, but I am impressed that I managed to make it stay together. Uh, and this is a small section of a burnt eucalyptus branch. I'm making a massive installation of these now for a coronavirus special online show with my gallery in Sydney uh, and Smith Gallery, and that'll be open in a couple of weeks. Here, if you would like to see the Life Forms tour, these are the upcoming dates um, and places. So, Murwillumba, Townsville, Moorville, Mount Gambia, Albury, Armadale. And then these are shows I've got coming up. So that sharing stories one is online now because of coronavirus and lockdowns. Um, Falling Branches, the one I was talking about. Um, uh, James and I have work in the Melbourne Art Fair uh, as announced today in the um, Adelaide Biennial next year, which is super exciting. Um, we're showing our inhabiting work again. If you're in Canberra, that's in May, May to July next year. Um, I, would, I was going to tell you about all these shows, but there's no time left. Um, so a uh, physical solo show that I'm really excited about next year with N Smith Gallery, uh, one with Kitan, another solo with Kitan next year, and then another collaborative work with James. I'm really excited for all of these shows. Um, and I will stop this share now and open to questions. Hi, Beth. Thank Hello. You. <laughs> that was great. That was amazing. Oh, thank you. No worries. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of those amazing things about your practice. I really must admit that I spent quite a lot of time with your work looking at those eucalyptus leaves. So that was really nice to see how you um, came up with that solution with that, that work. Um, I just have a few questions here. If anybody would like to post some more questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A function or the chat function and I can read them out to Rebecca. Um, our first question is from your experience with presenting these kinds of interactive pieces, have you found that letting your audience touch the works generates new stories and conversations? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so one reason I really like letting people uh, touch is because everyone communicates in different ways and, and, I, um, and feels in different ways. Um, and I really think that art should be more than just, I mean, it often has to be just a visual language, but um, the ability to touch just opens things up so much more, you know, sound and touch and smell. Um, I've had a lot of interesting conversations. Um, the, the best was from a woman who was blind um, when it was installed at uh, Ramsey Art Prize um, in uh, 2017 and she didn't know I was the artist and she was talking about how she touched the rabbits. She's like, oh, my God, and she thought it was the, um, the, the weirdest thing and she was saying, oh, my gosh, it's just like when I was a kid and, you know, like, um, and then, yeah, I... I, I don't know. I, I think people, people seem to get a lot out of being able to touch things. Um, I love touching things. My mum these days, I have to stop her from touching artwork in galleries because she's used to touching mine. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, different. Yeah, no, I just think the way that everybody communicates and and feels and interacts with the world and gets things out of the world is so varied so um that's why I love giving that opportunity and because I'm such a tactile person like how like of course you have to communicate in a way that feels natural to you and um yeah I hope I answered that all right <laughs> yeah no, that that was that was great thank you um there's a few more questions here we've got a comment from the lockup saying our install team who are deinstalling at the moment just wanted to say that Snow Rabbits was their favorite work in the show. <laughs> so. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> um, 
I was really stressed sending that work off because I spent so long on the leaves um, that I was sort of pushing it to the last minute, getting it sent off, um, putting it together and getting it sent off. And it was like, I, put, I spent more time recreating that work than I did initially making it. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope it's all right. And I, everyone's positive feedback has made me feel really amazing. So I'm glad people are getting things out of it and yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of um, happy audiences um, interacting with that work, definitely. Uh, another question is from Esther. Uh, they wanted to ask you on that moment where you segued from the ethics behind your work and, and going back to casting, you said this is a bit random as though the segue might be jarring, but I wonder... Was this about needing to reconnect with practice as both an artistic and a political technique? Um, your work is both heavy and light and your experimentation is so deeply committed. I wonder if as an artist, sometimes the best way to negotiate the ethics is by working the hands anew. Mm. A, a big That's question, a I know. Beautiful, beautiful question. Um, I'll try my best with that because I like hearing that my brain wanted to like go into many directions um so yeah I I for me um the actual practice of making is in itself super important that experimentation and um I I think it was important for me to find new way like new languages to work through and um you know, to physically work through with my hands. And, um, and it's true that, um, you know, there are embedded hypocrisies in my actual making as well as in the final product of my work. So um, if we're talking about, you know, those, um, those pieces that are made from, you know, the used skins of animals, then, um, you know, it's could be like me wanting to create work that talks about that in itself, I am um, doing something that could be considered unethical and for me is personally jarring. And it's the same as creating work that talks about our overconsumption through using um, non-biodegradable materials. That's so freaking hypocritical, you know, like, um, and that process um, and that conjures in itself, like its own feelings of, um, uh, unease um, and I think there's a lot of unease in my making as well as there are points where I really enjoy what I'm doing um, and I really like I love um, I love you know I love doing things with my hands and making but sometimes I'm doing things that are quite un uncomfortable and jarring and I think that can come across in what I'm like you know what I'm what the final product is and uh, so I think it's important um, but yeah so uh -huh. Yeah, that might relate to the next question um, a little bit. Um, does your work open up a space for ecological grieving? And that's oh, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And I think that's where I'm at. And if I'd had more time, I would have talked about it. So I'm glad you asked. Um, and I won't get too much into it, but um, like our son's health has been pretty pretty bad since he was born, um, and he's doing pretty well now. Like he's a freaking champ. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. But, um, in myself like that, becoming a parent, um, you know, like I feel as though there's this like thing bigger than myself that I can feel and understand. And it, it's gone from like the very biggest amount of love to like combined that with like the lowest depths of grieving and I've always felt that sense of grief like throughout my life for what feels like um an inability like an ineffectualness when it comes to what's going on in our world um <clears throat> and that yeah and a massive ecological grieving um and it, it's only been really recently that I feel like as a parallel with everything that's happened with my son that 
I can feel it so intensely because my capacity had to grow so much for what I could feel and understand and take on. And like, I don't know, I just, um, I think, yeah, I've been making like, a lot of my work now is, is, is following that. Like, you know, I grew up as a child, like dreaming about like, not, not like daydreaming, but like having dreams about what would be, the destruction of the world in a sense it's like I don't know how that happens I've talked to other people who have had dreams like that as a child and I think it's just from a young age you're realizing everything that's kind of going wrong but you still have to keep functioning and going on as a member of society like a functioning member of society you can't if, if you if you take on too much you will go crazy and you just have to do as much as you can or and sometimes even a a little bit can feel too much because life can be intense, especially right now with everything going on. Um, and I'm trying to explore that more, that sense of ecological grieving. And um, I mean, when if you're talking about, if we talk about, especially like that work I was talking about, Young East and Grey with that kangaroo laying, like kangaroo Joey laying on that bench. Um, yeah, I think that that gave me the opportunity to really, um, you know, yeah, talk about, talk about that grieving and have it have like a, a more physical parallel because it's such a big, it's such a big thing that this world is going through and we just continue, um, you know, shopping on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that is a really great answer. And that, that work, the Joey work is so, it's really powerful and, definitely as a mother like having that connection with another mother and um those yeah those parallels between you and the mum is is really really important um to really show I think um I've got a couple of other questions here yeah how do you deal with the maintenance of the animal tronics and their interactions? And do you make the heating and automation pieces yourself? So two questions there. Yeah, well, you might've noticed that recently since I have had a child, so he's almost two now, I haven't been making many animatronics because I really don't have time for the maintenance and um, I don't ha and I don't really have the capacity to go install a lot of things and maintain things a lot and um it's probably something I'll come back to in the future um but for the meanwhile it's a pain in the ass a lot of the time um I have to say like I've gotten a lot better at making them so um I'm pretty sure they were all still working all the rabbits by the end of the lockup show <laughs> but I think uh yeah so yeah I've gotten a lot a lot better at it but yeah, anything with electronics is going to give you grief. It's a it's a massive investment. So that um, that invasive installation, um, I would go there and then like you know the chair might have stopped rocking or, um, like I don't know what else. The sound might not have been put on that day or something like that. And yeah. Uh, sorry. What was the second part of the question? Um. Do you? Uh, or do I make it myself? Yes. yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a, another question. Um, do you also feel as a bio artist, do you also feel as a bio artist in a wider sense? Eduardo Cax Alba falls to mind somehow, as well as TCA's No Arc. Hmm. I'll have to look them up. I'm not familiar with those either but um but, but thank you because I love exploring new artists yeah. yeah um I think that was the last question there's just lots of comments here about um how much everybody loves your practice and your work um yeah I, I think that that might be the last question all right that's that's um, really cool um yeah thank you everybody um I wish I could have done it in person. I could have thanked you in person and um, yeah, uh, but this was really cool and I didn't have to leave my house or my room. Yeah. yeah.
Awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you guys at The Lockup and from Experimenta for everything you do. So amazing. Um, and I really hope to go check out The Lockup one day. Um, Please do. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's such a shame that you didn't get to see your work there, but um, we'll send you lots of photos. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for um, listening in to the lecture today. It's an amazing um, opportunity to speak with you in person and hear about your incredible work that you, you do. And, yeah, so exciting to hear about more of your work. So, yeah, thank you. And thank you to Experimenta as well, um, our amazing partners. Um, hopefully next time when we have Experimenta at the lockup, we will be um, able to present the whole entire show without any um, COVID interruptions, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.